my pleasure to introduce Steve Pyatt, who is a recovering engineer and now loves to talk, travel, and read. Uh, race relations has been an interest of his for half a century. He's not telling us how old he is, though. Today he's going to share what he's learned, but his perspective is just one person, a white person, and he's going to address that. At MIT, he earned his Bachelor of Science, Master of Science, and Doctor of Science degrees in nuclear engineering. He worked at INL for 32 years and survived, <laughs> mostly. He had 57 peer-reviewed journal articles, three book chapters in nuclear system and environmental barrier engineering. And if you know what all of that is, you get extra points on the test. In the speaking and leadership organization Toastmasters, he's earned the top Toastmaster Education Award, the distinguished, excuse me, distinguished Toastmaster twice. He's been in 32 countries and all 50 states. Um, thanks to the Idaho Falls Library Extreme Book Nerd Challenge, he's read 70 books each of the last two years and 64 so far this year. He writes columns for the Post Register, so I'm sure you've seen his name in print. And he's a nerd and proud of it. So, I give it to you. We know the definition of slavery, don't we? Can any of us feel it? Earlier this year, I came across this quote. Dr. David Livingston. This is the same one in that famous greeting, which really happened. Dr. Livingston, I presume. And I was pretty close to where that event occurred earlier this year. Dr. Livingston spent the last half of his life living in Africa, not as a tourist, but with the indigenous people. Ate, prayed, traveled. And he said the following, the strangest disease I have seen in this country seems really to be broken heartedness. It attacks free men who have been captured and made slaves. They ascribe their only pain to their heart. Place the hand correctly on the spot, Though many think that the organ stands high up under the breastbone. Some slavers, and there was slavery there well before Europeans ever set foot in Africa, expressed surprise to me that their slaves should die, seeing they had plenty to eat and no work. It seems to be really broken hearts of which they die. If words don't convey at least a bit of what slavery must have been like, I offer this picture. This is in Mombasa, Kenya. My wife, Robin, and we are in a dungeon in a fort and prison that the Portuguese built. This is below the sea level. This is hard coral rock. And the picture doesn't do us justice because in here and in here, slaves brought from the interior, being ready to be sold and put on ships, tried to claw their way out of hard coral rock. How desperate must you be to do that? Now let's bring it to us. Think any of your ancestors were slaves? By the end of the talk, we'll come back to that question. I don't know all of your genealogy, so I'm not going to go around and 
point fingers. But I won't point fingers at myself. <coughs> you think any of your ancestors were slaves? Some other questions. How universal was slavery? Most of us looking around the room are primarily of European descent. What's our legacy? What's the legacy in the United States? And what does it mean today? Those are the questions that had been driving me since I was a little boy. As I was growing up, <clears throat> this man was my hero. I was living in Nashville, Tennessee the night he was killed. And I'll never forget that night. Because we lived outside Nashville, he was assassinated in Memphis, and riots started immediately throughout the South. They were only stopped when King's lieutenants got on the TV and radio and told people that's not what he would want. <laughs> I went to school to segregation three times, and I'll say more about that later, in South Carolina, North Carolina, and then when I started college in Massachusetts. I've been in 32 countries, one's in Korea. Earlier this year, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Kenya. And that was quite interesting. And of course, slavery and racial relations are central to what has happened with those countries and what is there today. So let's look around the world in a couple of countries. How did people become slaves? Captives? Debt? Crime? And in some cases, including certainly the United States, if you were born a slave, you were a slave. Different countries have different mixes of these. I'll start with China. This is a book I read last year, thanks to the Book Nerd Challenge. I highly recommend it. I have it as an ebook, so I can't share it with you here. It's a book called China, A History by John Key. It covers, in roughly 600 pages, 5,000 years of Chinese history. It's fascinating. Slavery is certainly there. There are records going back at least, well, 1,000 years before Christ. You got to be a slave by debt or by a prisoner of war. The first attempt at abolishing slavery was by kind of an interruption in the Han Dynasty. He abolished slavery, but it didn't really stick because 300 years later, we know that a former slave actually became the emperor. Talk about rags to riches. <clears throat> Slavery persisted at least into the 400s. And the Mongols, of course, ruled China for a bit. And during that time period, as, as late as the 1600s, there was slave and slave trade. Mexico. Good book. Mexico's indigenous past. Debt and crimes got you into slavery. Early on, being a war captain did not get you into slavery, it got you sacrificed. Picked your poison, yes. Later on, as they would have more and more captives and more need for work in temples, then sometimes slaves would be used there. Only later was slavery inherited, and only later than that was their slave trade, which existed before the Spanish ever got to. A really fascinating book on the Aztec and Maya, which I've mentioned in a previous Friends for Learning talk. One, as I was rereading the book for this talk, a particular story struck me. In one time period, the Aztecs would pick a slave every 20 months, and I won't try to pronounce this Aztec god's name because I'll get it wrong. 
So over the 20 months that this person served as a slave, if I can say it that way, you get more and more honors. Eventually he got presented with four wives. And on the final day of the month, the youth was led to a full ritual, the Great Pyramid, outside what's now Mexico City. And there he said goodbye to his four wives, was placed on the stone, and his heart was pulled from his body. And then his flesh was eaten. Slavery is, is universal. The Maya, murder and adultery, well, you didn't get to be a slave that way, you got dead. Theft, you'd have to serve until you had essentially worked off. Captives were generally treated with respect and, and sacrifice. Wikipedia, an entry, I recommend slavery among the indigenous people of the Americas. Indigenous people held other indigenous people as slaves. And then when blacks started to be brought to the Americans, they would hold them as slaves. Certainly the Europeans did the same. But the Europeans had more technology. They had the boats, they had the guns. So they did this on a much larger scale. It's interesting, after Columbus started trying to bring slaves back to Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella, to some degree, tried to inhibit this. But they left too many escape clauses. That, well, you can make slaves out of cannibals. Or if you were fighting a just war. Or if the person had already been a slave, and you were just purchasing that. Kind of a big, wide open set of uh, loopholes. Another good Wikipedia entry is the timeline, abolition of slavery. Athens had slaves, abolished. Rome had slaves. Uh, this is India, most of India. So slavery is all over the place. But it increased as the Europeans came in contact with Africa and with the Americas. Often, religious leaders would try to limit things. I just mentioned for an enemy's belt. And then this article ends with this kind of good news, bad news. Slavery is now abolished de jure in all countries, but some practices akin to it still exist. Sex trafficking, for example. So unfortunately, although I would tend to use slavery in the past tense in this talk, that's not totally accurate. A book read uh, two years ago on Spanish history. Spanish history, of course, is interwoven with slavery. Mexican slaves were held by the Christians during the Reconquista. Christian slaves were held by Muslims at times. And when the Spanish, and especially Portugal, came in contact with Africa and the Americas, all this increased. Now a little bit of an interlude. This is one of the most fascinating books that I have ever read. And I will tell you, it was difficult for me. Robin Walker is a historian in the UK. I think he describes himself as a black radical. This book was difficult for me because of his anger, which pervades the entire book. And why is there anger? His thesis, which he largely convinces me of, is that Europeans have hid the evidence of strong African civilizations that existed before the Europeans started wandering around the coast of Africa and slowly moving Italy. And why? It was to justify European conquest and to justify participating and expanding the slave trade. It's a powerful book. 
But I will warn you, it is not easy to read. It's very detailed and full of anger. I'm curious, who has read the, the book Guns, Germs, and Steel? Okay. I have easily read a thousand books in my life. Of all the nonfiction books I have read, this is my top one. The author starts with the question, when or why did Europeans' guns, germs, and steel prevail? When the Americas came in contact with Europe, or Australia for that matter, or with Africa, why was it that the Europeans went there? Why was it that the Europeans had the guns, the germs, because most of the disease went in one direction? Why? Why did that happen? The answer, in my words, is that it was not because they were somehow superior people, which folks have made as an answer, but rather geography's impact. And in simple terms, so here's, here's the world. The author points out that we know that in very early times, domesticated animals, plants, technology, could move back and forth along there. And indeed, that's where the larger early civilizations were. The Americans are not organized that way. They're not laid out that way. Plants domesticated here are useless there. That concentration of, if you will, biological assets led to cross-fertilization, literally and figuratively. And I can't give you the whole book in one talk. That's his answer to the question that he poses. It is certainly a historical fact that when the Europeans did come in contact with all these other places, they dominated. They did it on their terms. book I read earlier this year, The White Nile, is a history of the exploration for the source of the Nile, which we now know to be Victor Lake Victoria, around Uganda, Kenya, and so forth. It turns out the book is just as much about slavery as exploration. And I had no idea that was the case. You can tell a book, by the way, that I like when you see all kinds of colored stickies on it. This is where I learned about Dr. Livingston, by the way. Indigenous people had slaves in much of Africa, certainly along the Nile. Then Arabs, before Europeans ever got into this place, <coughs> Arabs had gone down the coast of Africa and had infiltrated. They got to all these places. They understood all this geography well before Europeans did. Now, no idea that was the case until I read this book. The book was published in 1960. So the Arabs made the slave trade and slave distribution worse. And then the Portuguese took it to another level. I showed you one of the dungeons there. British slowly turned things around. And the history of exploration of the Nile is all about that. It's about different explorers who were trapped. They were there for a mission. And later on, there were missionaries. But the indigenous people didn't want to give up slavery. And there was actually kind of a bidding war between Arab Muslims and European Christians as to who was going to influence the native leaders the most. And slavery was certainly one of the issues. Some of you have probably seen the movie Out of Africa. Well, this is the book. Well, I have it electronically. It's a good book. I've, I've been to that house. It still stands. It's a museum outside Nairobi. It's a good book. It's, a, it's okay movie. The book's a whole lot better. But if you read the book, 
If you read the book, her racist attitudes, which aren't in the movie for some strange reason, I guess I didn't want Meryl Streep to play a racist character. I'm just speculating. But her attitudes, which today we would call racist, are very prevalent. It's quite kind of jarring to read. You can see I'm moving books from one stack to another. Another book recommendation. A fellow who was a British journalist for 30 years, traveled all over Africa, wrote this book, basically a chapter for each, year, each African country. And what's fascinating is how much difference there is. Of course, the map we see of Africa today was mostly drawn by Europeans. And it often had no logic to it other than how the Europeans wanted to figure things up. Uh, two of us, by the way, Mick Nelson and I, will be giving a Friends for Learning talk. This is an unashamed plug. Next February 26th, we will talk about visiting Kenya, Botswana, and Zimbabwe. So, where are we so far? Silent slavery was universal. The Europeans made it worse as they came in contact with Africa and the Americas. And now, this book. Does the name Henry Louis Gates mean anything to anyone? Listen to. Well, under President Obama, we had the so-called Beer Summit. This was the professor who was arrested by a Cambridge, Massachusetts policeman because he looked suspicious, a black man in a well-to-do area near Harvard uh, trying to get into the front door. So that caused a whole uproar. Well, he wrote a book. And it is excellent. And I'll give you some information now, the next some couple of slides. It is looking at African American history over almost 500 years. Two, 12 and a half million Africans were taken from Africa to the United States, or excuse me, to the Americas over 365 years. <coughs> Ninety percent of them had been captured by other Africans and then sold or traded to <coughs> Four percent of that 12 and a half million came to the United States. Fifteen percent died crossing the ocean. Well, that means all the other 81% went someplace else. Okay, Mexico, more slaves went to what's now Mexico than the United States. Haiti, Cuba, Jamaica. Any guesses as to where half went? Brazil. Bingo. Portugal. Portugal had a mass importation of slaves into what was then their colony of Brazil. If you go to Brazil, you can certainly see the ethnic influence of former Africans. Slavery was all through the exploration of the Americas. Balboa, who discovered, in quotes, the Pacific Ocean included, his party included 30 Africans. Cortez had Africans, some that were slaves, some that were free. And the first man to harvest, plant and harvest wheat in the Americas, because wheat's not native to the United States or to anywhere in the Americas, was a black man. The first slaves that came in what became the United States we're headed toward Mexico. Uh, things uh, got out of, out of planning and some, if you will, pirates. Uh, the Dutch captured some of them. Most went to Bermuda. And 20 made their way to Jamestown, 12 years after uh, founding the 
When I was growing up in small towns in the South, and to some degree still, there are black churches and white churches. We see that, it's not just in the South. In fact, for five years when I lived in Camden, South Carolina, my dad and I, and we take the family, we would go across town and we would attend the black Catholic church instead of the white Catholic church. And often, other than the priest, who was white, we were the only white people in the congregation. And that was an interesting experience that I quite treasure all these years later. But why did that happen? Does it sound very Christian, does it? It started back in the 1700s. And it was in Philadelphia. It was not in the racist South. It was in the racist North. <clears throat> you can read that faster than I can. And again, I'm coming from this book. It's a well-researched book. So basically, the whites forced the blacks out of their churches. Now, slavery was slowly dying out in the United States until the cotton gin came along. along. That led, in basically a decade, to a factor of 30 increase in cotton production. And it made slavery more economic, more economic attractive. So some time, uh, some dates. Yeah, it's a little fuzzy, but actually before the United States came into being, the Rhode Island colony abolished slavery. In the Articles of Confederation, <coughs> under the Constitution, there are all kinds of debates on what, what to do with slaves and slave, slavery. Meanwhile, in the UK, slavery in the UK itself was abolished in 1807. The British led the way. U.S. ended importation of slaves. <coughs> then Mexico ends slaves right after they became independent of Spain. UK extended their abolition of slavery to the Caribbean. Pennsylvania, on the eve of the Civil War, there were four million people kind of blacks. Most slaves, but not all, in the United States. And then, of course, slavery was abolished in the United States with the 13th Amendment. Brazil ended slavery much later. Saudi Arabia and Mauritania is really the last country to abolish slavery in 1981. We have Brown versus Board of Education. It's fascinating the description of that in here. Dr. King, 1964. Now, I'll finish with the book and talk about some of my personal history. I find myself in Camden, South Carolina for junior high when the Yankees made us desegregate our schools. Now, I had always been brought up to see people as people. And indeed, Yankees would come down. Can you still hear me? All right, I'll just keep my voice up. Yankees would come down and preach to us heathen Southerners, correctly, about race relations. And indeed, the South was forced to desegregate its schools. This town was 10,000 people. And I even went on Facebook and asked some of my old high school friends, their memories of this time period. And you know what? Some of my memories were wrong. <laughs> it wasn't quite as smooth as I had remembered. Then we moved in the middle of my junior year up to Kenston, North Carolina, and I got to do it again. Lucky me. Twice the size, 20,000. In both cases, I knew at the time, and it's certainly true, that just as in Africa, the legacy of slavery and European conquest varies by different countries, well, in the South, in desegregation, it varied town by town. 
some towns had city leaders that whether they liked it or not, they said, and I remember this, and it's, and it's, it's accurate, that we may not like this, but we are going to do it the best we can. In other communities, they took the opposite approach. And those were the towns that had trouble. Race riots. But another thing that I learned this summer when I contacted some of my old friends is that Kinston, North Carolina has a claim to fame that I had not known. It was the first public high school walkout in 1951. I had no idea about it. Atkin High School was the black high school in town at that time. In fact, it, and it remained that way until 1973. Well, black students had had enough. Mostly because there was a burned out gym that was not replaced. <coughs> so they staged a walkout. And it worked. 1951, before Brown versus Board of Education, before all of that sort of stuff. I had obviously nothing to do with it, <clears throat> but it still feels good to tell you. And then I went to Boston in 74, which was when the Yankees had to desegregate their public schools. It was a mess. Senator Kennedy gave a lecture in an Irish part of the town. He had to run for his life to the nearest subway stop because of the violence that broke out against his talk. Don't tell this old Southern boy that only Southerners are racist. Ain't true. I witnessed it. So where are we? Well, ancestors, you think any of your ancestors owned slaves? I, I have at least one, another person nodding. My grandparents on my father's side moved to the U.S. from Italy. Mediterranean, lots of slavery going way back. So I have answered my own question for myself, the saying, Probably the answer is yes. The only question is when and where. Not in the United States. But somewhere in my history, I probably have slave owners. Were any of the ancestors themselves slaved? Well, the losers are less likely to leave the project. So, project. So it's, that's less likely to be true. But if you go back far enough, it's certainly possible. But it's something to reflect on. <coughs> Slavery is universal. The Europeans made it worse. It's by no means unique to the United States. Essentially, every country in the Americas was founded in the presence of slavery, not just the United States. The British led the elimination. The U.S., at least in the 1800s, the U.S. wasn't far behind. And then a really difficult reality is when this debate was happening in Britain, the United States, and elsewhere, one of the reasons given to justify slavery was the supposed inferiority of blacks. And that's where Robin Wright's book, When We Rule, comes in. It all connects. We suffer from this today, and it's why if you have any doubts on this type of topic, I'll come back to guns, germs, and steel. The fact that the Europeans conquered the world was not ethnic superiority. They were lucky. But this is part of the legacy of slavery. 
Racism is in part the legacy of the justification of slavery. Certainly, slavery caused a massive disruption in black culture, in black families. The countries in Africa that I visited this summer have some of that as well because of colonialization. And I have to emphasize, only because my daughter's not here to <coughs> remind me publicly, <laughs> that as a white man, I cannot understand what that weight of history must be like. I can seek to understand, as I have for most of my life, but I can't. Now, leave me with a story. When I was a grad student in Boston, first year of grad school, my apartment, we had four people, one of which was a friend I had had from senior year, a black man, who is a native of Boston. And uh, we joke a whole lot about all this sort of stuff, because we were good friends. But one night, he told the following story, which is how I have tried to internalize what it's like to be black. Just one short story, which was, when he was growing up in Boston, a very racist city, by the way, he lived at a boundary between the black area and the white area of the town. And he remembers going to a candy store. His little boy. And he realized, even as a little boy, that the shop owner paid more attention, was keeping a closer eye on him and his black friends than on little white boys. And the shop owner was himself black. Imagine growing up that way. I can't. I mean, I can say those words. I can try to put myself in those shoes. But I can't. I mean, I didn't grow up that way. So slavery was certainly not our fault. Slavery is, unfortunately, fairly universal in world history. But we suffer, all of us, today. And all we can do today is try to understand some of that history and try to take our own personal steps at helping each other deal with that legacy. Question. Well, I'm not hearing stories, so that's a good sign. <laughs> it's, it's kind of hard for me to understand, <clears throat> probably because I'm white, and had opportunities when I was growing up. <clears throat> and I never thought that much about my past, but the past in my family. Because I had all these opportunities in front of me. And yet that does not seem to be the case with the blacks. And, and I understand the arguments that you presented and, and the history and stuff, but <clears throat> I can't understand why history and the past is such a burdening factor. We're all, did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'll take a crack at answering, but I'd love to hear other people. We're all a product of our history, our personal history, our experiences, our family, what we have <clears throat> inherited, but we're also a product of our decisions. And the countries that I visited, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Kenya, actually illustrate that as well. In Botswana, the royal family there made a decision to become a biracial family. And the king married a white woman. And that's reflected even on their state flag 
the national symbol is a zebra, <coughs> black and white. So it's, it comes down to individual decisions influenced by what comes before. But I remember in 73, 72 and 73, attending the black church in South Carolina. And the church in the black part of town, I mean, people could go to any church they wanted, but one was in the black part of town, one was in the white part of town. The one in the black part of town was more run down. The congregation was less wealthy. I was the same, same parish, two parishes had been long merged by the bishop in Columbia. But these people and these people had a different church. Now that's not answering your question, it's just an example that when it comes down to the things that influence you, day to day, year to year, you, it's, it's your surroundings, the people you know. Okay? Yeah, I, I think this is the right term, but it's kind of a paradox that as recipients of white privilege, we have a hard time recognizing white privilege. In the far in the back, you. Yeah. <laughs> The problem is it's not passed. I said the problem is it's not passed. Twelve years ago, here in Idaho Falls, I hired a young black woman. Sitting in restaurants with her in Idaho Falls and hearing disparaging comments directed at her, often in a language other than English, as if it wouldn't be understood, well, I'm fluent German Spanish, and she was bilingual French English, so we had no trouble understanding the insults, and they were exceedingly hurtful, directed at her as she ate lunch with her boss. It's not the past. You uh, were Today, what part does the government play in easing or exacerbating race relations? <laughs> Man, that's, I, I, again, I'll give you my own answer. That is all over the map. I'll, I'll give you one unfortunate example and, and how this, this cuts in so many different ways and sometimes is, is an excuse not to do the right thing. My daughter Valerie chose Tulane University in New Orleans to go to college. Her moving into college day her evacuation because of Hurricane Katrina day and her 18th birthday were all the same. <laughs> so through her and following what was going on where my daughter was living, I learned a lot about New Orleans. There were all kinds of commissions and groups about how to rebuild the city. The Lower Ninth Ward is the lowest level of New Orleans, which means it's pretty far down. Well, someone had the idea not to rebuild there. I mean, the only, as Einstein has supposedly said, you know, definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again, expecting a different result. So why put the Ninth Ward back where it was? When that suggestion was made, those who made it were attacked mercifully mercilessly as racist because the lower ninth war then and now it has been rebuilt black so this is a case where a logical to me a logical step not to keep doing the same stupid thing again and again was considered racist because it was primarily displacing blacks from their home now I don't know how to get out of it 
came to the and said, Work. there are other people who wanted to come. Yeah. A part of the problem, I believe, is the situation prior to the Industrial Revolution. Largely, biology was destined. Your children inherited your wealth. And if you were not in that wealthy, favored category, the, the struggle uphill was daunting. If, and it only became possible in the United States, partially because of distance and the, the weakness of the government here, and then the industrial, the industrial revolution enabled poor people to become very rich and pass on that tradition to their, that benefit to their children. For most of human history then, biology decided what your children were. Also, I would like to echo what this woman said about recency. My parents and my aunt and uncle lived in a retirement community in central New Jersey. When my aunt died, my uncle wanted to sell the house and move to California where two of his three children were living. He chose quite independently to sell to a black family. And he was vehemently attacked and denounced by his neighbors for being so free thinking. Bringing it home, what he's just said. I, recently, I sold a home about three years ago here in Iowa Falls. While it was on the market, uh, the real estate people that I was working with brought a black family to that home, to my home, to look at it to buy. A neighbor who lived in that area saw what was happening, saw, saw a black family coming to look at the home, and came over and knocked on the door, we were not home at the time, knocked on the door and said, we don't want trash like you here. And the people left. And what I did was I called the police because he was trespassing on my property. I still live there. And I sent a letter. The police couldn't do anything. But they did say I could send a letter to this man telling to this, this family, telling them that they were never to trespass on my property again. So that's what I had to do with copies to the police and copies to the real estate agent who then gave a copy to the people who had come to look at my house. So it's here in Iowa Falls to recent. That was three years ago. Why did you have to send the letter to them? Because the police couldn't do anything. But I, by giving them warning, that if they can't trespass on my property again, then the police can do something they can do for trespassing. Not for, not for the problem with black, but for trespassing. The neighbor who came over and knocked on your door should have the... Yeah, that's, that was my that's pleasure. That's what I should say. That's your case. There was a, another suggestion made in New Orleans hey, for the... Hey, hey, can you move out of There was another suggestion made in the North... The, lower ninth ward, and that was that the ward be rebuilt on higher ground as an integrated community, but that would have displaced a white community. And if the black community had a problem with having no rebuilding, the white community expressed at least as strong a reaction that they might be displaced or that an integrated community might be built. Because the attitude of most people in the Lower Ninth Ward was, if we are not going to rebuild on the land we own, where can we build? It seems to me that the weight of history is fear. And that's come from misinformation and, and ignorance, which breeds fear. And fear was, has been prevalent throughout and is obviously still prevalent today. If you're not like me, and I've heard that all these terrible things about you, I don't want you here. That is a huge weight to deal with. And as a woman, I've dealt with that sort of ignorance in trying to go to an engineering school and being told in 1980s by my professors that I was just seeking a husband and they were gonna give no time to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. ignorance breeds fear, breeds 
It does. Crap like that. And, and tr the tribal nature of humanity as a species is certainly not new. In Kenya, for example, there's a large number of ethnic groups. And I was part of a group of seven, and one of which is a black woman who lives in Boise, born in Kenya, came to the United States, bringing her, at the time, infant daughter, who's not 13. And one night at dinner, we were talking on some of these topics, and I happened to ask Salome, how do the different ethnic groups in Kenya tell each other apart? And I was expecting something like, you know, facial uh, features or skin color. No, it was dress, jewelry, the human instinct to think, you know, this is my group, and I'm safe with my group, and this group is not mine, and there's somebody else, the other, that is something we all have to come, in, come to grips with. It is universal. That's not going to kill. It doesn't make it right, but it, it exists and we need to recognize the fear of the other. One of the problems still going on this last week is voter suppression, too. Yes. Especially down south, and there was, yeah. There was a great 60 minutes done on voter suppression at this one black college that wouldn't let the black kids register to vote under their, their addresses in the dorms. And so then when they went to register, they didn't have a permanent address and they just, and it's been going on, it's even gone through the Supreme Court like several years ago, the same college, and now they're still doing it. <clears throat> One of the things that, that kind of, I, again, I can't get my, <clears throat> my arms around it is the fact that in this country, when we were being settled as the you know, there was a lot of segregation going on, and we heard a lot here about segregation being a, a you know, a kind of a dominant theme. But back then, when there was segregation of Poles and Italians and the Irish, time took care of the problem. You know, it took it took a generation and maybe two generations, and that segregation disappeared as those communities merged. But in the case of the blacks, it seems like that segregation persists. And, and that's another thing that I just can't quite understand why time hasn't taken care of this problem. I, I per, personal opinion is we've made a lot of progress. And, and certainly those who would claim that the United States is some, somehow unique in this regard, no. I, I hope I've given you some data to, to tell you. Our history is our history, but it is by no means unique, other than the details. But certainly in the broad brush of history, this is a worldwide issue in different ways, different places. The trend is in the right direction, in my opinion. And I'll, I'll close, perhaps, with, with a symbol of hope. In Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe, I, of course, had to go buy trinkets and help out the local economy. And you see, strangely enough, a lot of the same things in the same in, in, in different stores. I came across this. In most days since, <clears throat> I wore it because it symbolizes something to me. Something we also saw in villages, traditional villages in Kenya. <coughs> The black is elephant tail. Elephant tail. And it is, of course, a symbol to me of tradition. The other color is copper wire. The new. The one bracelet, both. And we saw that all through Africa. Also Morocco, years ago I was in Morocco. Different details, same story. Africans
Americans are surmounting what the Europeans <coughs> did to them. And if they can, we can. Yes. And maybe it will. And maybe it will. Thank you very much.